he's now called my ex but I stayed on. <laughs> and um, I've stayed and I love it here. I'm raising my children here. That's a work in progress as well. Um, and of course, I love living here. It's a beautiful place. Um, people holiday here, you know, living by the sea, all that stuff. Um, but I also, you know, one of the most important things I think that I've learned in Cornwall is that I found something I didn't know I was missing, and that's community. Um, and Cornwall taught me what community means. Um, community means you don't always like each other. <laughs> um, you don't always see eye to eye. But when push comes to shove, you pull together. And I know that Oliver hinted in his um, opening remarks there, um, you know, there is work to do. We are in what is being called an ecological crisis, a biodiversity crisis. I'll be perfectly honest, I find those words are starting to kind of feel a bit empty. I hear them so much. So put another way, and with the Cornish context, I think the way I think of it is, um, and it's all around us, what, you know, in the setting around Heartlands and in this part of region of Cornwall, there are these really rich layers of, well, geology, first of all, then there's the prehistory, history, culture, and the kind of the sum total of that, where we are now, is the land, the sea has been worked really hard. And frankly, the people too, you know, um, the history here is, is a complex one. Um, so that's kind of the way I think of like, if you know, the words ecological crisis are sort of starting to kind of like feel empty. I, I, that's how I think it's like the land has been worked hard. The sea has been worked hard and people have too. So to kind of lend a little bit more of a scientific um, framing for that, the UK is famously now, quoted as being one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. And I know Cornwall has its very distinct identity, but I'm sorry to say it's part of that story as well. So Cornwall Wildlife Trust in 2020 um, released the State of Nature report. And there's loads of stats in there. Um, but just one of the things that I found really striking was it found that the, what I call the prince, species of principal importance have lost about almost 40% from their range since 1988. And more importantly, in the last 10 years, that rate of decline has accelerated. So we're on like a steeper part of the curve, if you like. So that is why we're here tonight. I'm assuming that's why we're all here tonight, to discuss the trends and how we can turn those around in the context of the tools that are available to an organization like the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And one of the biggest potential tools in the toolbox, um, and I appreciate for some people, this may also be a spanner in the works, but one of the most important tools in the toolbox is rewilding. And there are so it's a sticky term now it, it has many connotations some people love it some people don't um so there's going to be a lot of discussion around this topic hence the title for this evening rewilding our last hope or a current craze so i'll just say this as well we are going to focus tonight on rewilding in terms of terrestrial habitats the land um, we're not going to delve into the marine environment tonight. That's a whole different other story, very different challenges, and I'm sure we're going to have plenty to uh, chew on tonight. So we're going to stick with the land. And before I hand over to our panel of experts who are waiting patiently, um, I'm just going to quickly run through the format for this evening for everyone here and also for everyone online. Hello. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to introduce our panel um, who will all be invited to share about Four minutes each. We're going to try and stick to time, Gillian, um, with their opening remarks. And I'm going to just ask each of them to answer the question, what does rewilding mean to them? Then we're going to have another 30, further 15 minutes of discussion with the panel. And then we're going to open it up to the floor. 25 minutes of Q&A from all of you here in the room. We'll, there'll be someone with a roving mic, um, but we'll also be taking questions online as well. We've got a team there watching the chat. So to introduce, oh, and before we finish, then um, we will have a few words from the new CEO, Matt Walpole, who will be sharing some news from the charity. 
So that's kind of how it's all going to run. And um, without further ado, I'll just really quickly introduce each of the panel members and then hand over to them. So first of all, we've got Benedict McDonald, television producer, conservationist, nature writer, and author of Rebirding. Um, he's also the head of the nature restoration for Real Wild Estates and has recently written the vision report for the Trust's Helmand Tor Nature Reserve. Then next to Benedict is Chris Jones. I'm sure many people know him. Um, organic livestock farmer, owner of Woodland Valley Farm, famously the site of the Cornwall Beaver Project. Um, Chris started his career as a policeman in Zimbabwe. I didn't know that, um, but has been farming in Cornwall for the last 20 years, for over 20 years, deep interest in wildlife and farming. Sarah Crowley, Dr. Sarah Crowley is next. A uh, senior lecturer in human and animal geography at the University of Exeter Penryn campus um, and is here to talk about the human dimension of conservation and environmental issues and I'm really glad because I, I do feel passionate about we love nature I love nature I love wildlife but I'm also you know love people too so it's it's great to have you here thank you Sarah and finally, last but not least Cheryl Marriott head of conservation at Cornwall Wildlife Trust has been working at the Trust for nearly 20 years um, and really has a real passion and an interest in, you know, Cheryl will tell us more about that in rewilding principles. So that is the introduction and I'm going to hand over to Benedict with um, a few opening thoughts about what rewilding means to you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, was, I was in a pub in Wales, um, not in working hours, um, a couple of weeks ago, and somebody said to me, you're not from around here, what, what do you do? I said, well, I work with farmers and landowners to restore nature where it isn't there. We bring it back. And he said, God, he said, I didn't know that you can make a job out of that. I said, well, it was giving it a go. But if I'd said to him, you know, I'm a professional rewilder, it might have been a very different conversation. And I think it's it's telling briefly before I say what it means to me that the word um, is a word. It, it can instigate all kinds of positive emotions of hope, of restoration, of bringing life back from almost nothing, or it can conjure fear, doubt, the idea that you may not be wanted anymore if you're a farmer, abandonment of land, <clears throat> loss of jobs, or even clearances. And, and the fact is that the word has become uh, uh, toxic in some circles, which is quite sad because when we actually think about, I think how most of us using it are meaning the word for, for myself, I'm talking about the slightly less catchy term process led ecosystem restoration, um, which doesn't slip off the tongue and probably isn't very good for engaging the public who really love the word rewilding. We think 80% of the public want rewilding to happen somewhere in some form that doesn't necessarily mean wolves lynx and brown bears it means bringing nature back restoring nature not merely conserving what we have which is conservation but restoring what is rightfully ours that we have lost which is restoration which is what i <clears throat> started off by writing about and now i'm very fortunate to to do for a living with Ironically, given a lot of the Twitter headlines, farmers, landowners, gamekeepers, and foresters are the, the people who are supposed to hate rewilding, but when you do it with them, they love it. However, words can, can attain all, all kinds of different meanings. But for me, rewilding means restoring nature. It means restoring communities and people. It means keeping existing farmers and landowners on the land for longer than farming the land to the nth degree but it means restoring climate balance in a time of climate crisis, whether that is a beaver keeping water on the land in the, in the ever harsher summer months that we will face in this country, particularly in Southern and Eastern England, but also um, restoring water courses, using natural regeneration of woodland to um, slow flooding and allowing nature back into our floodplains, areas that are unsuitable for farming, or areas given over to land uses like grouse shooting and deer estates that constitute 16% of Britain, but are producing 0% of human diet. So for me, the conflict between, or the imagined conflict between food production and, and rewilding is, is addressed by the fact that there are many areas in the UK that are suitable for full spectrum 
ecological restoration. There are other areas suitable for a, a fusion model between farming and nature restoration. And there are other areas where we should be producing our food. And with only 6% of Britain built upon, I believe we have the space for rewilding to function as a spectrum across all of society, not just for the, uh, the, the elites or the larger landowners. Thank you, Benedict. Um, I'm going to ask Chris um, <laughs> the same question. Chris, <laughs> you're a farmer. You make a living <laughs> farming. What does rewilding mean for you? Uh, um, um, first off, I don't own Woodland Valley Farm. I own it jointly with Lloyds Bank. And that should tell you a lot about farming. You know, it's it essentially in our system, uh, um, in, in our sort of British ecosystem, it's an unprofitable activity, mostly. Um, I, I, I don't want to talk about rewilding quite just yet, but consider this. Since the 1940s, farm income has gone like this and farm profit has gone like this. Uh, uh, we have been heavily subsidized, but we've also spent a fortune, uh, many, many fortunes on uh, ever bigger and better machines, uh, ever more nitrate fertilizer and ever more deadly chemicals. The chemicals are really clever because the, the, the upfront nasty ones like DDT got banned a long time ago, but we have food web murdering chemicals out there uh, sold in garden centers uh, and uh, farmers use it, regenerative farmers use it just as a matter of course. Uh, when you've got things like Roundup, which just wipe out virtually any living plant you can imagine, um, all that stuff it's supporting or would have supported a whole host of other stuff going on. So um, if we just think back a little bit to the, the question about rewilding, my very first point is it's lovely, it's brilliant, it's of its time and it's necessary, but it is nowhere near enough. If we want to th uh, uh, think about uh, things systemically, we need to be farming organically. Um, I have to pay a thousand pounds a year plus to have the privilege of being inspected by some spotty geek and say, yes, you can carry on being an organic farmer. Whereas my neighbor who uh, throws around chemicals and fertilizer with gay abandon, he has to do bugger all to just, just up, justify himself to anyone. This is mad. We live in a, a, a through the looking glass world. And until we get this, this uh, um, a, a system changed fundamentally, which involves everyone sitting in this room, not, not just me and, and Defra, uh, we are on a hiding to nothing. Uh, frankly. Uh, so I would ask uh, uh, that we begin to think much more in terms of systemic change across the board. Um, you know, we, we, we've gone from farming being uh, uh, an exercise in applied ecology uh, in my father's time to in my time it being an exercise in applied chemistry. And this is a dead end, never mind worrying about bees, butterflies, and turtle doves. This is a dead end for us sitting here. And we have got to unravel that. Um, uh, rewilding per se, uh, speaking as a farmer, it scares the pants off of, of many of us. Not me particularly. I quite like the idea of, uh, of a lynx uh, uh, slinking through my woods and, and slaying the odd roe deer, lovely. Uh, but, but for a lot of people, it's really, really frightening. Uh, and I would say, uh, through my involvement with the with, uh, uh, Beaver Trust and working with beavers for the last uh, seven or eight years, that the, the, the point we're at now, it's, it's no longer about science. It's no longer about public opinion, really, because most people are up for it. It's about the government, so a socio-political issue, actually getting them to, to get off their hands and take a few Pretty easy to decisions. Um, oh, thank you very much. Have I used my four minutes yet? Uh, <laughs> who am I to stop that? 
Because um, I can just carry on with the stream of consciousness. Well, no, I mean, that, right. yeah, real talk is what I would call that. Um, Chris, thank you. I think um, we will definitely be coming back to that, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of questions. It's probably a good segue, actually, to bring Sarah in because, you know, it is as much about people um, as it is about nature and wildlife. Um, Sarah, what are your thoughts? Thanks very much. So I am going to take a stereotypically academic take on rewilding here um, because I actually think that it's interesting to think a bit about where it comes from. Um, so we talk about rewilding in the academic world as a cluster concept. It's become a cluster concept. And what that means is um, it means different things to different people. And there is a thread or two threads, which I'll talk about in a moment, of continuity between the different ways in which people talk about rewilding. But we'll also, I think we'll also find that the fact that people understand it to mean different things is part of the reason that it's so controversial. So the first thing we have to think about is the fact that rewilding has a history to it. Um, and that history is that it comes from America in the 1980s, where it was originally called wilderness recovery. That was its original thing. And it was based on this idea of what's called the three C's. Um, that's poor areas, corridors between those areas, and carnivores. And the idea was that to recreate a wilderness area with a fully functioning ecosystem and all of the trophic levels, those are the things that you needed to have. And so that's why when people think about rewilding, they think about wolves in Yellowstone. This is the kind of the classic example of rewilding. Um, but it also has a geography. Um, and I'm in geography, so I would say that, but it's true. So when rewilding came from America over to Europe, it changed its shape. Um, and in Europe, you'll find that a lot of rewilding initiatives still have this idea of keystone species. So that species that change the whole ecosystem around them. Um, but it really focused more on herbivores um, and some ideas about how um, historical forests work, for example, um, and that use herbivores for large grazing. So if you look at European rewilding, there's a lot more focus on large grazers, but also beavers and these ecosystem engineers that are definitely more herbivorous. There was less of a focus on the carnivores. And then you get to Britain and it's changed shape, to shape once again. And my colleague, um, Ginny Thomas has referred to rewilding in Britain as domesticated rewilding. Um, and that's because Britain is, um, it's an island, so nothing's going to really recover naturally. It has to be reintroduced, but also it's very densely populated. We have a patchwork of different land ownership. We have small patches of land um, owned by lots and lots of different people. And so the idea of your cause corridors and carnivores doesn't translate very well into the British landscape, but people have still been very interested in rewilding. And so they've taken different approaches. They've looked at smaller scale projects incorporating native breeds, for example, to replace those large wild herbivores. And there is a lot more um, contestation around the idea of, of reintroducing large animals like carnivores. So there's been a lot more focus on reintroducing smaller species and with the exception perhaps of beavers, less controversial ones. So that's also an interesting Thing to think about because those three different ways of thinking about rewilding also mean that within conservation this is controversial right this isn't just a, <laughs> there are people who are rewilding purists and they can't stand the idea that rewilding means different things and has come to they feel like it's been watered down in britain that it now means something else but i think the thing that ben touched on briefly was this idea of process so the thing that holds these concepts together as a cluster there's two things I think, and one of them is, is this idea of restoring ecological processes. So if we think about biodiversity as a work of art, a painting or a building, that bits of it are falling off or crumbling, um, then we have to restore them and put them back together. But when we think about process, we might think about biodiversity as a performance, a piece of music or theater that's going on all the time. And we think about conducting it differently. So it's more of a process-based approach, and that's really distinctive. I think that's what makes rewilding approaches stand out. They're focusing on restoring ecological processes and then stepping back away from that um, to greater or lesser extent. And the second thing that I think makes it distinctive is that it's future-oriented. Um, the, I mean, as Gillian kind of hinted at, the 
working in conservation in the UK feels like you're sitting on the sand in the top of a sand timer and it's all just leaking away below you and you're kind of trying to grab handfuls of it to keep hold of it. It's all about stopping things going extinct, saving this patch, conserving that thing, and it can feel a bit hopeless. And I think one of the reasons that rewilding is different is because it's about creating something. It's about creating resilient landscapes that can last over time. And so it's got this kind of future oriented view to it, which I think is really appealing to a lot of people. Okay. Thank you. Um, Cheryl, I know that you're gonna be able to talk about rewilding in the context of the Wildlife Trust, but I wonder if you would tell, maybe share sort of like what it means to you personally, like you've been doing this a long time. Um, how do you feel about it? I'll go over four minutes if I do that, but um, Sarah's just described very well um, working in conservation and it can feel a bit hopeless and I think that probably is exactly why I'm so interested in this because it's the, for the first time it's something that you think really can make a difference. Um, I, I think if we get it right in Cornwall then adopting a rewilding approach could make the difference, it could be transformative. It's not going to fix things by itself, of course. And as Chris said, um, so we need to be thinking about it with all of the nature conservation work that has happened up to this point. It will complement all of that. We haven't been doing it wrong. We're just taking a slightly different approach now. So we add it to all of that. Um, it has to be set against the backdrop of regenerative farming, but genuinely regenerative farming. I take Chris's point about um, not all regenerative farming is as regenerative as they would like you to think it is. Um, so with all that together, and there's a real momentum of, of this feeling of change in, in farming now, which we as consumers should all be supporting. Um, I think yeah, all that together does make me feel more optimistic about the future. Um, of course, I think a lot about what rewilding in Cornwall might look like. Um, this is about taking inspiration from past Cornish landscapes and using that to inspire this new 21st century approach. Um, we've got to be realistic, though. We have to, this has to fit the Cornish context. We're a highly, highly modified landscape. Um, three quarters of the county is in productive farming. Um, and we should really be thinking as well about how we can benefit society more widely through, through our rewilding projects. So I think there's two main ways of um, that are relevant, two main ways of rewilding now, which are very relevant um, to Cornwall. The first one is, you could call it domesticated rewilding, or, or I've heard it called farmed wilding. Um, and this is the idea where large landowners, so we're talking hundreds of hectares, so not everybody is in a position to do this. It's not going to happen everywhere. Um, but if you get these large areas, fence around the edge, let the vegetation recover a bit if it needs to before putting this mix of species in, the cattle, the ponies, hopefully some pigs, maybe some deer, and let them, in a naturalistic way, uh, manage that site for us and get this dynamic mosaic of habitats. That, that's the, the dream. This is inspired by, of course, the Nepa State, which probably everybody has heard of and read Isabella's book. Um, so that's that's relevant to Cornwall. There's people in the audience, Jan and Camilla, who are already doing it. They've, they've, they've beaten us to it. This is the approach that we'd like to take for Helmand and Tor. Um, Ben's helping us with the plans for that. Rewilding Britain have kindly given us some funding to, to get that moving as well. So, so that farmed rewilding um, is happening already um, and I think we should be supporting the private landowners that are doing this because um, they're creating new nature reserves we're making existing nature reserves better and we're trying to make them bigger but there's other people out there making the nature reserves of the future and, and, and that's just just brilliant and we should support them the second thing that's relevant right now is wild beaver reintroduction um, this has mind-boggling potential. Um, who's been to Cornwall Beaver Project? Put your hands up, brilliant. Um, this is at Chris's farm, it's, it's five acres, two hectares. Um, the beaver activities have increased the number of birds and the number of species, the small mammals, the amphibians, the fish, the dragonflies, the damselflies, you name it, wildlife is responding and that's in two hectares. So if we can scale that up, it, it's gonna be immense. 
um, and this is where we're going to put our energies. Um, we've um, we're trying to do this at Helmut or two. It's not going to be easy. Um, we're lucky that St. Evel local business that makes candles is funding us to to start our wild beaver journey. Um, but they're the two things that I think have really got legs right now. The next generation of conservationists will probably be even more ambitious. I hope that we're laying some really good groundwork um, for you, if there's any of you in the audience or online. Um, so I think it's exciting times and watch this space. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. I mean, that I think, you know, the way you sum that up there is a really important point. It, um, it's making changes now that will ring forward into the next generation and beyond. And somehow there's something very poignant about that because gosh this is going to be a bit of a sad turn but you know it's likely that we won't all you know we won't see all the benefits of this but to set that in motion um is quite a legacy and i think that's really exciting um i've got a few questions before we open this up to the floor we're doing good for time um chris you you hinted at the sort of the fear that rewilding strikes in the hearts of farmers. And I kind of get that. I like food. <laughs> and I'm sure we all do here. We all need to eat. How, how does that sit with you? Does, the, does this threaten our sort of food production, food security? So, I, I mean, I do hear a lot of that. What do you think? It, it doesn't have to. Um, I I read Isabella Tree's book before going to NEP. And when I read it, I thought, well, we're doing all these things at home. Um, and while we're not as nepped up as NEP is, uh, we have fundamentally the, the features that they have there. Um, you know, I haven't trimmed a hedge, well, lots of them for, for 20 or 30 years, uh, for example. Uh, and um, uh, and the grass looks pretty bloody ragged too. Now, uh, but we still produce uh, uh, cattle off there, and we have a um, a, a young tenant who is uh, setting up on a micro dairy there, so we'll still be in business. Now, scaled up across the piece, uh, it, it's slightly harder to draw uh, conclusions. On that, I believe, but I, you know, if we just had the switch into organic farming more, wildlife would respond to that, even if it was being farmed relatively hard in an organic sense. Just stopping poisoning will make a huge difference. Uh, uh, insofar as rewilding with a capital R, I guess at the moment that's mostly occurring in. Upland farms of grade four and five, and they're not desperately productive anyway without working really hard at it. So I, I, I don't think there's going to be a huge drop. What I would say is if we think about land, though, um, before oil came along, our land gave us the food we eat, the clothes that we wear, the shoes we walk around in. All of these things came from it. And we must never, ever forget that, um, you know, this, this oil thing has got to stop. Uh, and we need to have a countryside which is uh, vibrant enough and able to support all of our needs. And, uh, yeah, that's enough. Um, I, yeah, of course you can, yeah. I just I think this this idea that that it's I, for a given bit of land it's either wildlife or food is is a false dichotomy that isn't the choice it's way 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 more complicated than that um there's there's so many I mean we could have a session just on that um I think we have to be careful about well, have a look where where do these rumors start? And I have a suspicion that anyone who wants you to think it's that simple has some kind of vested interest in the, in the status quo. Um, food security is is about 
political unrest elsewhere in the world. It's about climate shocks. It's about a broken food system. So, um, we're growing too much of the wrong kind of food and it's killing us. Um, dietary ill health is the biggest preventable um, um, cause of illness now. So it's it's way, way more complicated than wildlife versus food. Well said, yeah. Um, um, I'm going to just sort of slightly switch away from the controversy, but also just sticking with um, the rewilding theme, because that is the theme for tonight. Um, I think, Ben, perhaps you could um, answer this question. Why is there such a focus on particular species, these keystone species? Can you help people understand why, you know, some species kind of stand out, pop up over the radar more than others? Well, I think that two, two answers. Until quite recently, we focused on species, bitterns, roseate terns, that we have assigned stone curlies in particular this ecological importance because there used to be lots of them in the farmed environment, then there weren't many of them. And so the historical conservation approach has been to bluntly garden for those species. So you have stone curly plots, you keep your naughty trees and scrub off your Dartford warbler habitats. The problem is a lot of those species may have only been thriving in another type of degraded environment, a different type of field. So arguably they didn't show us the right way forwards. They may even have shown us the wrong way forwards. What I find exciting in ecological restoration rewilding is that if you want to nail your colors to the mast of any particular species, excuse the metaphor, beavers would be a fantastic example because they engender the very basis of life from zooplankton and phytoplankton upwards. They create photosynthetic interactions between sun and water by uh, coppicing. They work free of charge, we believe. Um, and, and they are truly the, the guardians of whole orders such as fish, which of course have evolved over millions of years to jump beaver dams, contrary to some of the stuff that you hear about beavers eating or indeed blocking fish roots. So there are particular magical species, I referred to them as cornerstone species in, in my, my last book, that punch well above their weight in the way that they interact with and shape the environment. So instead of passively living within woodland, the wild boar is the, the great gardener or the missing gardener of many of Britain's woodlands. It's, it's scruffy, it's messy, and that's exactly what nature loves. It rotivates, it causes chaos, it accidentally creates amphibian ponds, it creates the basis of green-winged orchid habitats in the Forest of Dean. Everywhere that I've gone in the Forest of Dean in the last 10 years that is alive with flowers and low scrub and white admiral butterflies has been brutaled 10 years or five years earlier by a family of highly disruptive wild boar. So messy, untidy, yes, of course, but you have to go back after the event to see what these species are doing. You have to give them time to show you the wonders that they can create. And yes, whilst controversial, wolves and lynx, lynx in particular being the more um, suitable candidate, I believe, for reintroduction into select parts of Northern Scotland, control deer in a way that no human forester can do by engendering the fear factor whereby deer are continually kept on the move and therefore do not browse down uh, the woodland. If anyone's been to the Forest of Dean or the New Forest recently, the canopy is having a great time. The understory is non-existent. It's like a cathedral floor. You can see for miles. There is not a nightingale left. There's not a willow tit, not a marsh tit, not a garden warbler, because the deer being unchecked by keystone species have eradicated the very basis of the next generation of woodland. So it's a pretty serious problem. Now, of course, we can't have big predators everywhere. And indeed, we will probably only have lynx in my lifetime, if, if I'm lucky, and probably not wolf, and only in certain parts of northern Scotland. So we are still going to have to do a lot of ecosystem fakery, deer management, for example, pretending to be species that no longer exist. However, at the moment, we're going around pretending to be beavers, creating ponds, when we could just have beavers, which is ludicrously expensive. 
and time consuming and at the very serious end it's actually costing people their lives because beavers in every tributary slow the flow of water into rivers which flood people's homes and that that's less less funny and more of a, a vital reason to have beavers unfenced across tributaries particularly in areas like cornwall that are prone to flooding due to historical deforestation so keystone species you know, they are the magical talisman that I believe can manage Britain alongside us and not in competition with us. Um, very quickly, Sarah, I just want to direct a question to you, um, which kind of speaks back to the question of why rewilding might be contentious. And you hinted at that when you talked about the the cluster concept, uh, a word meaning different things to different people. And I've just wondered whether you've got anything um, to add to that in terms of your perspective as a geographer, the political economy, how different people value the same thing, the same patch of land differently, what do they get? And, and who gets to have a say in all of that? Um, you know, is this the root of where the, content, the, con the, the reason why it's become contentious? Yeah, thank you. So, yes, so I hinted at some of the reason it's contentious is because not everybody agrees on what it is. And if somebody is picturing um, Yellowstone National Park in Kent, you know, that's going to be a bit of a jarring concept <laughs> where it's not going to match up entirely. Um, but I think actually some some of the key reasons that it's contentious are sort of flip sides of the same coin. So one of the reasons that people don't really talk about very much that rewilding is popular is because it's very romantic. Um, we have ideas, cultural ideas about wildness and the wild that are not really necessarily fulfilled in Great Britain, which is, as we've discussed, pretty nature depleted um, on the whole. Um, you know, it's, we, we have this, the, it sparks the imagination, the idea that you might see a species restored that wasn't here previously, the, the idea that you might be in a place that is a bit more wild than, you know, a, a bit more, a bit less controlled, I suppose, um, than you might used to. And, and I think there is a real appeal to that. Um, the flip side of that is that other people feel that it's romanticized. So that this is not a reflection of the reality of the places where these projects are going to have to be put into action. It's not a reflection of the a working landscape, for example. So I think there is a sort of a, a pull to rewilding on the fact that it's it's you know got this romantic side to it, but also a push back against that romanticism, um, you know, and that's connected also to a long-standing idea that conservation and rewilding are imposed from the outside by people who don't have to experience the consequences of the action. Um, and I think in any kind of project um, or ambition, there is has to be recognition that the costs and benefits of things aren't always evenly distributed. So the people who have to manage, you know, even, even on a very small scale, the, per the person who has to deal with flooded fields from a beaver dam is, is not the same person who gets to go on a nice beaver walk and see the beavers. So it, there, there isn't an even distribution necessarily, and that is also a kind of cause for, for, for conflict. So I think a bit of recognition that those benefits aren't evenly distributed is, is quite useful. Um, and then, yeah, I, I guess I guess there is the, the the second thing is just that that idea about control, and this has actually been touched on already. This idea that, that you know, for some people, the idea of rewilding and and kind of giving nature back some control over its processes is really exciting, but for other people, that's very scary because if there's no end if there's no end goal, um, there's no control over it. Then what's that what's that going to look like? You know, we do live in a country that's very closely managed, both in conservation terms and in agricultural terms. And so we're not used to things being let go. And I think that is that is quite a quite a frightening concept, understandably. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that or I think when you <clears throat> when you explain to farmers, landowners and gamekeepers on the ground what is actually going to happen, particularly that beaver ponds can be used as aquifers for livestock. They, they don't have to be pristine, hands-off, non-farmed habitats, as I'm sure uh, Chris will attest as a true farmer. They can be integrated 
as they are in Germany very successfully, into even highly productive environments, then I think I always find farmers, landowners, and both gamekeepers, foresters, are more excited by that slight letting go than conventional some conventional conservationists who feel that their job is threatened if they can't, you know, cut a hay meadow on a particular normally highly unsuitable date, deliver a quantifiable yearly outcome which nature managed perfectly well without for millions of years. But my biggest headaches doing this for a living are actually triple SI designations because they enshrine a, a fixity and a control with far more vehemence than any farmer or, or landowner that I've met. So I think, yes, it is scary if you're a carrot farmer and suddenly, sorry, I'm not using officially the term carrot farmer, but if you're if you're growing carrots and suddenly a beaver has um, magically appeared in a stream near you and is causing chaos, that's extremely problematic. If you've planned for that animal to be on your land, you only need to allow 10 to 15 meters either side of a water course, which is good practice anyway, for the animal not to be a problem at all. So a lot of this is is about the, the, the sort of pragmatic detail of how we put these animals back in the landscape and explain the benefits aren't often what I explain are the pragmatic financial benefits, not the romantic um isn't it lovely to have a beaver benefits? Because unsurprisingly, if you are working the land, you need to know that the beaver can work in your interests and not just against them. Go ahead. Just Chris and I agree on most things, don't we, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> but we have we've we've had discussions about the use of the word rewilding, and you've encouraged me not to use it. Um, but I ignored you. Um, I'm look how you know look we could have filled this hall twice um that that might be because Gillian or Ben it might be because of the word rewilding we'll have to ask you why but it does excite people and it's already out there so I'm not going to start using a different word but we we do talk about rewilding a, a rewilding approach or rewilding principles to try and show that it isn't one thing it's a whole, it's a concept. Um, and I want to keep using it, but explain what we mean by it, because um, you're hopefully you're all, most of you are excited by it. And that is a great way to open, <laughs> open up for questions from the floor. Is there the roving microphone? So yeah, please wait until, I don't know if you want to put your hand up. Do we have any questions? And um, yeah, and if you can um, say if there's anyone specifically who you'd like uh, the question answered, or if it's a general question for the panel. Uh, this is a general question for the whole of the panel. Uh, DEFRA is pursuing a policy which I think is described as public money for public good. Do panel members think that this will help to promote regenerative farming and rewilding, or are panel members... Sorry, it's the last one. Okay. okay. Have I got a, yes, he's got the uh, microphone. <laughs> to, to me, short of actually declaring that we will only farm organically in this country, public money for public money for public goods. Excuse my microphone. Your microphone. Uh, uh, public money for public goods. Hold fire! Hold fire! Should I just talk normally? Can you? Can you? Can you hear me? Oh, I see what that is. Okay. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Soon have a, a pile of a pile of duff microphones around me. Uh, um, I think that the uh, concept of public money for public goods uh, is the next best thing to just declaring organic farming being being the default now. Um, I think that if we were systemic about it and said, right, what are the crocodiles nearest the canoe? I think we would agree that the state of our rivers and the state of our climate are uh, the real big systemic threats to us, us as a species right now. 
if uh, I've I've been farming my place as a, a, a positive carbon sink since 2009, and we've managed to save up lots and lots of tons of carbon under the soil. Naively, I thought we'd just flog that at some point, but as time has gone on, I've got more and more disillusioned with the whole idea of offsetting. Different subject. Uh, the point is, though, that if we farm well for carbon and for water, we are farming well for wildlife. And so if we could, if we could harness the public uh, goods agenda properly, if, if DEFRA could get a grip, uh, I think it would be incredibly positive. Anyone else want to add to that? <clears throat> What I do is explaining to landowners that not only is it in the interests of the planet and doing the right thing to give over some fields to scrub or wood pasture, but amazingly, you can even be paid these days for bramble if you embrace some of the new systems. And, you know, whilst very far from perfect, I think it is far better to pay um, for nature restoration than either the continuum of the status quo or sort of the, the what I call the hedgerow modification payments. Um, the nature restoration payments, particularly, for example, the wood pasture payments available coming on from Natural England are actually, you know, I think really going to encourage farmers um, towards doing the right thing. And I think it's not a magic bullet, but it's definitely a really positive step. We have another question. Um, I'm going to let Marty navigate her way around the room with a microphone. There we go. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm going to ask quite a controversial question. I hope you can all handle that. Um, the context is that I'm a Reiki master. So I feel respect for all life forms. I feel connected to all life forms. And I'm a dreaded word, vegan. So, um, Chris, I'm looking at you. And I appreciate, because I love all creatures, that organic, cre uh, organically raised creatures are often done so in much better welfare conditions. So I'm not going to go into the whole argument about veganism. But the question I have is that there's a bigger movement for those people who see the connection between our regard for all species. Some species we think are cuddly, cushy, and we'll look after them. Some we won't. Um, and the other question I have, uh, as a point to make, is that what if us vegans got our way and we had much more food production that was veganic? How would this impact, would you say, on this balance between food production and nature and rewilding. Is there a benefit to be had to persuade some of that food production over to veganic crops, et cetera? Thank you. So what we eat, how does that impact the outcomes for rewilding for wildlife? Um, it, it definitely does. Um, we could talk about veganism or, we could, or vegetarianism or just any meat eaters eating less but better meat. It's the same principle, just different extremes. Um, it totally makes sense for us, any of us that eat meat or and dairy and fish to, to eat less but better. Um, we, we have very inefficient ways of producing animal protein through growing grain that goes into cows and growing protein foods on the other side of the world that brought into cattle. So if if we change the way we eat and by the way when most of us are eating twice the protein that we need to anyway and three times the sugar so this this the diet our land use and nature is it's all interconnected so i think we can all make sensible changes it doesn't not everybody will want to go as far as you have um but it will free up more land and more space for nature so i think it should be encouraged and we want need to of course then we're looking after the animals better in those kind of systems and the next thing we need to do is get more money into the farmers pockets for producing food in the way we want to see so it, it is all connected and we can make all of us make better choices
I can see Benedict. Um, yeah, big believer in in less less and better meat. I, I suppose one might be wary of replacing one set of monocultures, i.e., dairy or um, you know the average hillside of Wales, the pea green sheep lawn, with another set of monocultures at the crop end. And I'm not saying that that would happen. That would be a false dichotomy argument. But I think. Um, I mean, I, I personally eat, eat meat, but I greatly respect those those who don't. Um, you know, I believe in very low intensity grazing, probably nowhere near enough to support the current human diet. But um, having traveled quite a lot, especially places like the hills of North Spain, I've never seen habitats more alive than wood pasture, very lightly grazed woodland. And if there are animals there doing the grazing, um, whether cattle or indeed in this country, particularly deer, then I personally see no ethical objection to what Christopher Price at the RBST calls a good life and a good death. That's purely my, my own principle. But yes, I think when you look at the breakdown of land in the UK, there is there are the crops grown that go directly into us or into products like bread that go into us. There are the livestock where the grass goes into the livestock that then go into us. And there was the huge areas um, of some of the worst ecological practices that feed the animals that then feed us. So the wastage in the system is, is extraordinary. Um, I think it's more of a cultural um, thing that if we're going to phase out types of farming, it's got to be done softly, gradually, and with great economic respect for the fact that, say, in Wales, people have been farming that land with sheep for thousands of years. So it is something that needs to be approached with a lot of cultural, social care. But ecologically, yes, the amount of Britain given over to livestock farming relative to the fact that lamb is less than 1% of the human diet is entirely disproportionate. And I think I would love to see that proportion addressed through more of the grade four and the grade five land being given over to, to woodland and to nature and the productive land being made more productive. <laughs> I'd just like to say that um, uh, my sort of take on this is that um, veganism is, is a perfectly viable and, and, and sensible lifestyle choice, but it will not save this planet. What we need to have, in my view, is agroecology, which will include uh plant and animal farming industrial farming is a revolting practice whether it be dairy cows kept indoors or chickens or pigs or whatever it is a revolting practice and it is a damaging practice at worst spiritually and uh, uh physically uh, uh to this to this uh the, the, the world we live in um we do what we do at home. Uh, you know, I, I, I grew crops and cattle. We had a carbon audit. And we discovered that we were emitting 300 odd tons a year of, uh, of uh, CO2 equivalent. When we looked into it, uh, we found out that the way to stop that was to stop plowing, to stop growing crops. The crops we were growing were not fit for human consumption in any way. We don't live in a place with a, a climate or soil good enough to do that. We were just growing crops to feed cattle. So what we do now instead is grow grass, just grass, uh, good grass, good grass for wildlife that harbors so many voles. We had a visitation of three short-eared owls this, this March who hung around for a couple of weeks because the hunting was good. So, um, yes, animals have to do my bidding. And yes, they die when I decide they're going to die. Apart from that, which doesn't feel with glee, apart from that, I think we're doing a fairly good job and I think we need more of that. Thank you. I suppose 
plenty has been said about this. I think the only thing that I might add is um, there is potentially a tension between um, rewilding. Um, so if you were thinking about rewilding in the what was called, called rewilding max, which is creating landscapes that are effectively so-called wildernesses, um, the, the way to produce food then is intensively. And so there is a tension between some forms of rewilding and concerns about things like animal welfare, because unless everybody turns vegan overnight, which unfortunately doesn't seem very likely, um, I, I think you end up with actually an increase in intensive farming in some in, in some people's ideal world of rewilding, where you have land spare land land sparing, where you basically create huge areas of wildland, that means that that any agriculture that does go on is going to be more intensive. So there is a, a kind of an interesting tension tension there as well. But like I say, that's not that's not necessarily all rewilding is. But it, it doesn't. They don't necessarily. They're not necessarily good bedfellows. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for the question, actually, because, um, you know, everyone does need to be heard. And I think you see it's, you know, everyone's very prepared to to deal with these issues. Um, and, you know, this is what this is about, um, to be able to talk. And I, I mean, I love these face to face things, but we're not going to forget that we also have an online audience. And I think we probably have questions from the online audience. So Tom is going to read them or read a question. Got a number of questions coming online. I'm going to pick one of the more challenging ones, um, which is from someone who said they are they are well they are excited and welcome the the thoughts which um, have been given. Sorry, I need to lean forward because I can't actually read it. Um, but um, uh, they they are uh, they they think there are also risks with bringing beavers in, um, and that there, there could be important species which could be lost if the concept was pursued to the nth degree. Uh, particularly with scrub management, as herbivores can't do that alone without impacting species like marsh fertility. So is there also a role for continuing scrub management by humans, even though that's potentially expensive? <clears throat> as the person who authored the uh, Hellman Tor uh, report, where my one of my many aims was to save uh, the Cornwall Wildlife Trust a huge amount of money on scrub management through the use of beavers. I mean, the the honest answer is in areas where you have beavers, which is not going to be away from a watercourse or indeed every watercourse for the foreseeable future, then clearly um, you will need another scrub cutting agent than a beaver. But to compete with a beaver within its territory would be extraordinarily foolish and expensive because you couldn't even begin to create the myriad complex changing habitats that a beaver does through scrub management because it's carrying out, it's been doing its job for millions of years. It's highly skilled. It's um, creating very complex amphibian habitats, all kinds of things. Secondly, this idea that scrub is naughty has pervaded the conservation world and is one of the great banes of my life because scrub is the most fantastic complex habitat, particularly for nesting birds. Now, when we look at the landscape level scrub in the UK, it has become highly endangered, as endangered as the willow tit, because it has been tidied from farmland and it has been tidied from nature reserves with equal zeal. The Cotswold Water Park, which has effectively become a, a semi-abandoned wildland of bramble and elder, is still one of my favourite places to go because it is full of warblers and song and life, and it is just being managed by rabbits. And they are dealing with some of the scrub, creating a very complex mosaic, and you can walk in and hear nightingale, grasshopper warbler, cuckoo, you know, bullfinch, more red listed birds in an area the size of this room than anywhere that is managed for scrub. I think we forget that marsh fertilities didn't evolve um, in a world of humans cutting scrub. They evolved in habitats like Salisbury Plain, um, they evolved in river valleys, and they evolved beside beavers creating wet meadows, which as they slowly dry out, become the perfect habitat for marsh fertilities. So I think if absolutely needed, then 
you know, say Scrub has taken over a site completely, that would be unnatural because historically you would have had the bison coming in and bulldozing it. It would never have got to that sort of uniformity. But generally speaking, I think we need to completely reassess why we keep gardening our conservation sites. I think it's a massive problem. And I think that's the question that should really be asked. Perhaps I can't. I'm, I'm going to break the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you, you're on to something very important with that question. Uh, and I'd take it away a little bit, perhaps, from um, uh, clearing scrub with a beaver versus a, a chainsaw. There are landscapes in this country where beavers would be perfectly happy, but will not work with current land use. And I put it to you that the fens, yes, we could manage beaver impacts but the risk of getting a backlash from farming would be not only justified, it would be extreme. Um, I, I, you know, it's only a few decades since they got rid of the last koipu and a beaver is just a bigger, better koipu in that, circum in, in that context. So I think we should be very careful uh, to avoid causing unnecessary battles, especially early on. If I, it was a really good question, thank you. Just to give some reassurance, I mean, we we think that taking this rewilding approach is going to be great for things like the marsh fertility. It will open up new areas for its food plant. The devil's a bit scabious. Could even open up corridors um, to keep those meta populations, the different colonies that we've got at Helm and Tor, keep them connected. But we will be checking that that is the case. We, we've got good baseline information on them. Um, we know where the, the important caterpillar areas are. Um, so we will be keeping an eye. We're not just gonna completely cross our fingers and hope it all goes well. Um, so, and, and that goes for all of this and bringing the beavers back. Um, everything has to be done carefully and appropriately, um, but it, it's still very exciting. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think we're going to have time realistically for one more question, because I think in order to have it answered properly, to really give it its full airing, I'm not going to try and take too many more. Um, so one more question from the floor. <laughs> Lots of hands. I don't... Marta, you decide. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to ask everyone questions afterwards, but... Um... Hi. Um, I'm interested in the relative weight you give to the functional arguments for rewilding versus the romantic arguments. Uh, I've had my head in the function for 10 years plus doing research. Species do this, they do that, they do the other. But when I think about the future, why do I want beavers back in Cornwall? Is it because they do all these amazing things or is it because I don't want my daughter to grow up in a world where the most interesting things you'll see is a Frisian. Like, what's the relative weight that we need to give to the romantic argument? And do we risk putting too much weight on the function? Oh, I can take that one for a start. <laughs> um, as I brought it up. Um, actually, I think that's a really good question. Um, and one of the things we've identified recently, so colleagues and I have been doing work around the social drivers of reintroduction, as well as the ecological ones. Um, and that's been a really interesting uh, adventure because we started off by looking at white stalk reintroduction. And uh, one of the main reasons that white stalks are being re reintroduced is actually not really an ecological one. It's because there is a view that they were, they have a cultural significance and that they can reconnect people with, with wildlife, exactly what you're saying um, about. It. What's been very interesting is that the, way, the place in which that's controversial is actually mostly among bird people because there's a disagreement as to whether or not storks were actually previously resident in the UK. So um, there's debate around that. Um, and so, you know, so for some people, it's not a reintroduction, it's, it's an introduction. And, and that has a whole different set of connotations. But the point being that actually one of the drivers for doing that is, is, is you know, ecologically because it could be restoring a lot of species. Obviously, they, they'll have an ecological role. Um, but a lot of the driver is to do with um, 
what I refer to as, and I don't mean this flippantly, because it's cool. <laughs> And I don't mean trendy cool. I mean, you see a white stalk and I saw one in Montpellier last year and I went, that's really cool. Like it, there, there are some species that are particularly charismatic, inspirational, um, and there are drivers for, for, for reintroductions particularly, but also for creating different, certain types of habitats that are um, not necessarily romantic, but that are appealing to something that isn't specifically ecologically functional and the, the only risk you run if you rely very heavily on everything having to have a function is that everything has to have a function so if you find out that one of the things that you want to reintroduce actually doesn't make much difference if it's here yeah. then your argument has has gone so there are other there are other reasons I think some of them are very valid reasons some of them are ethical reasons um, the suggestion that we should be restoring things because we were responsible for their extinction in the first place is actually quite a strong reason for people to talk about reintroductions is very rarely mentioned. Um, so I think one of the things we're trying to figure out now is like, how can we give more consideration of, if not necessarily more weight to those, those kinds of arguments? 100% agree with that. I was on Kovrak Beach a few years back in the summer, completely did not expect to see a flock of stock fly past and the whole beach. It was an absolute showstopper. Everyone stopped what they were doing. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was great for that. Um, yeah, really quickly, because I want to make sure Matt has some time to um, share some news. Just just very quickly, from a common wildlife trust point of view, I think we are, we're going for function because we're here for nature recovery, which we're trying to reverse this decline in species. Um, so we've got to put our effort and your money as members and our funders money into the things that are going to have the biggest impact. So that's why we'll be focusing on, on beaver reintroduction. We're turning down um, requests for other species reintroductions at this point because we don't want to get distracted by wildcats when it's the beavers that are going to do all the work. Thank you. Benedict, quickly. <laughs> <clears throat> so, well, we know they used to paint white stalks on signs, which you tend not to do if the species isn't there. So uh, I think, you know, stalks, in my view, were native. But I think, you know, when you come back from Eastern Europe or when I come back from Eastern Europe to the UK, I go from a state of wonder to depression at the lack of wonder and awe that our, you know, children or indeed, you know, any of us here have left in this depleted land and you know swallowtail butterflies redback shrikes rhinox black turn these species used to be everywhere you know when you go to hungary in the hills of the Agilet national park there were 10 cuckoos per village can you imagine maybe if you're old enough you can imagine not being ageist but i can't i i remember cuckoos being reasonably common now i have to drive a hundred you know i have to drive to here one cuckoo in gloucestershire to two places we are starving our children of opportunity wonder and awe so i don't think it has to be romance or functionality i think it's both thank you and can we just have a really big round of applause again for the whole panel thank you so much Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. I'd like to invite Matt, CEO of Cornwall Wildlife Trust, Matt Wilpel, now to with some closing remarks. Gillian, thank you. <clears throat> and good evening, everybody. Um, I'd first just like to reiterate Gillian's thanks to our splendid panel um, who have kept us really well entertained and informed this evening. Thank you to all of you. But I'd also like to thank Gillian for being an extraordinary host this evening, for doing such a great job in marshalling us through this, and for being such a passionate supporter, not only of Cornwall Wildlife Trust, but of the wider Wildlife Trust movement on the other side of the Tamar. So thank you, Gillian, for all your time. Now, I've been here at Cornwall Wildlife Stuff Trust since last September, and you know, I think this might be the first time that they've let me out in public at least properly. So it's, it's lovely to see so many of you here in the room and to know that there are so many of you online joining this session as well. I'm also aware that for those of you in the room, I'm standing between you and some pasties. So I'm going to keep this as brief as I possibly can. Since joining the Trust, I've been really impressed and inspired by uh, the team we have and all the volunteers working with that team. 
their passion, their commitment, their hard work to really make a difference for nature in Cornwall and their enthusiasm to try new things, bold new approaches and experiments, knowing that we have to do far more than we currently are to turn the tide on nature's decline. And within that, of course, a lot of it depends on the work we're able to do with others, with partners around the county, whether that be farmers, as we've heard, people like Chris, whether that is other landowners, businesses, community groups, because we're only going to make the difference we need to make if we get far more people caring about, valuing, and taking meaningful action for nature. And ultimately, that's, that's what we're all about. We do our bits on our own reserves, the ones that we, <coughs> that we have responsibility for. And on those reserves, like Helmantor, we have a plan. So we are looking for those areas to be far better than they are already. We want to see nature thriving in ways that they currently aren't. We want those areas to be havens, oases of wildlife, at the heart of broader networks, um, of other areas of land and sea around our reserves, creating really flourishing net networks of nature uh, that really take us to a new level. And we want to use those areas to inspire others as, as areas that demonstrate what's really possible. And Helm and Tour is one of those areas where we have such a plan. We've got a plan, but we need support if we're going to be able to implement that plan, which is why tonight, and there's no such thing as a free pasty, tonight we are launching our new appeal. Uh, and it's one of our most ambitious appeals yet. It's an appeal to rewild Helm and Tor and the surrounding landscapes. But what I'd like to do now is to ask Scott to bring up a brief appeal video. We're at Helmetor Nature Reserve, south of Bodmin. This is one of the biggest wetland complexes we've got in Cornwall, and it's really important for a whole host of wildlife species, both of open wet grasslands and scrubby areas and woodland. State of Nature Cornwall report showed that a lot of Cornish species are in decline. What we know we need to do is to make our nature reserves bigger and better. Now, last year, with generous donations from our supporters, we were able to make Helmantor Nature Reserve bigger by buying a small farm, creamy farm, that was wrapped around on three sides by the Nature Reserve. Our next task is to make it better. We'd like to take a rewilding approach here at Helmantor, and that means taking inspiration from the past and the kind of animals that would have roamed the landscape and seeing what we can put back in the modern day that carries out those same roles. So cattle will be part of that, possibly even horned cattle. We'll be looking at pigs that will rootle up the ground and semi-wild ponies. Another element of the rewilding approach will be to bring back Eurasian beavers here to Helmand Tor. We know from elsewhere in Cornwall, when we brought beavers back, other wildlife follows. So here there's huge potential for these animals to help with nature recovery. We're really excited about our ambitious plans for Helmand Tor, but we can't do it without your help. If you can donate to our appeal, please do and be a part of the Helm and Tor story. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Now, I, I grew up just around the corner from here. I've spent most of the last 30 years sort of bimbling around the planet doing conservation in, in, in other places. But this is why I came back. This is the real inspiration. Uh, this is where we can make a real difference. But as I said, we need your help, all of you. So if you can support this appeal, we will be eternally grateful. If you can support in any way, donating, uh, raising awareness, telling your friends about it, getting involved, then together, I think we can do something really special here. And I think it can be a really real beacon for nature recovery in Cornwall. With that, I would like to end. I'd like those of you who are here to uh, please feel free to come and join us in the foyer. As I say, there are further refreshments. The panel will be around for you to talk to. So those of you who still have questions, you've got an opportunity. And there are several others of us from the trust, staff, trustees, and volunteers who will be here. Um, and we're looking forward to talking further with you. Thanks ever so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this evening and take care. Thank you.
I, I just want 